Hi, 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 uh, hi, sir. Sorry, there's a bit of lag, so just bear with us. I can uh, sense that. So, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, we are here at uh, Kaveri Hospital uh, with the heart team here. To my right is uh, Dr. Prashant Vaijanath, uh, who's the uh, senior surgeon. Uh, who needs not much introduction. He's the pioneers of TAVI in the country here. Uh, we have Rajesh Scrubners, we have Dr. Uh, Mohammad Abu, cardiologist. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Shiva, our uh, senior cardiac anesthetist, who's done almost all our cases. Uh, we have Lalita on echo, and uh, we, we will now introduce the uh, case. Let's go to the presentation, please. So, uh, our first gratitudes to the organizers. So we're very grateful uh, for the Salem Tick team for uh, including us and thanks to all the organizers, Elarko uh, Ramanandri. Above the organizing uh, team and uh, the uh, fantastic uh, lectures there, the thing that we miss most is the one I'm going to show you now. Next slide. Next slide is that fish. So we are really going to miss that fish. I hope you all had a very good lunch. So let's get on to business. Uh, we'll show our case history. Next one. So our uh, patient is a 60 year old man. His symptoms are shortness of breath on exertion uh, over the last six months. Next. His past medical history reveals he's had uh, coronary artery bypass grafting with three vein grafts, one to the LAD, one to the OM, one to the PDA in 2006. Uh, he also had a simultaneous uh, valve replacement to the mitral valve with a 27 millimeter perimount uh, again in 2006. He has hypertension and COAD and has been classified as moderate obstructive airways disease. Next. Uh, clinical examination revealed normal uh, observations uh, and uh, a diastolic murmur in the mitral area. Uh, there were uh, no signs of uh, acute decompensation, no edema. Next. We'll show you the echo findings. Can we go to the echo? We've done a TOE now, so we'll show you the TOE findings. Can we go to the echo? Show us the mitral valve, please. Are we visible and audible? Yes, sir. Before the echo, can you have a brief clinical exam? Before. What is the clinical presentation? So the clinical presentation, I, I, I guess you, you may have missed those slides. So the clinical presentation was shortness of breath and exertion. Uh, progressively getting worse over the last six months, unable to uh, go up a flight of stairs which he was comfortably doing before. That is the symptom. Clinical examination revealed a diastolic murmur in the mitral area. He continues to be in sinus rhythm and uh, there was no systolic murmur and there were no signs of cardiac decompensation. So we will go into the echo now. Uh, I hope you can see the echo uh, on the screen. So there was uh, significant mitral stenosis and uh, there was uh, mild to moderate mitral regurgitation, but the stenosis appeared to be the predominant uh, bioprosthetic uh, dysfunction in the mitral valve. Next one. Can you show us the gradient, please? So I hope you can see here we have a, a mean gradient of uh, uh, 24, 24 millimeters of uh, mercury, that is the mitral valve gradient. Mitral regurgitation, can we show that? There was mitral regurgitation and we quantified that as moderate uh, and uh, mitral stenosis appeared to be the predominant pathology here. Uh, so uh, he, wo he underwent a CT to assess his coronary grafts and also the uh, the uh, cardiac uh, anatomy. Let's move to the slides, please. 
and by the way his aortic valve was normal he had uh, severe pulmonary hypertension with the with a calculated uh, pa pressure of uh, uh, 65 millimeters of mercury uh, with an rvsp of 48 the ra is f uh, is 14 or 15 now so we uh, this is the ct analysis so this patient was seen by uh, our heart team uh, and I will let uh, Dr. Prashant uh, give some surgical inputs into this case. After that, we'll go through the CT. Uh, Dr. Prashant, over to you. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Um, this uh, particular patient is definitely a high risk for surgery for the simple reason that he has got three grafts, three bypass grafts. As well as in the first surgery, as you can see that the surgeon has implanted a relatively small valve, which is a 27 size peri mount. Um, the, whenever you do a redo surgery in a degenerated bioprosthesis, uh, because there is a lot of cicatrization of the annulus, when you expand the valve, it is ordinarily only possible to put one size less which means if you do a redo surgery in this particular patient, you will end up implanting a 25 size bioprosthesis, which will most probably lead to a patient prosthesis mismatch. So in this scenario, it is ideal that if we can do avoid a cardiopulmonary bypass, avoid a redo stenotomy and do a valve in a valve, which will be the valve plan as uh, Gopi will tell you, what is the valve size plan, which is going to give a very effective orifice area. Thank you. Mm. So we did a CT, which is routine as uh, one would uh, hope. So he had a gated cardiac CT uh, to assess the coronaries, uh, the graft status, and also his uh, valve. So uh, let's maximize the CT, please. So you can see here uh, uh, a multiplane reconstruction at the valve uh, level. Uh, the valve ID is about uh, 25. Uh, millimeters, which is the ID of a 27 millimeter perimount. Uh, you can see the multiplane cuts where it has been measured. Next one. So whilst uh, this is a video, I don't know if you can play this. Can you play this video? This is a multiplane uh, reconstruction video. If you can see here, uh, the one of the most important things of uh, valve in valve uh, mitral is uh, the possibility of LVOT obstruction because we are now going to convert the entire pretty mount into a covered stent. So if you see where I'm cutting through, uh, we roughly get an idea in systole where, uh, where, we, where I'm cutting right now what the neo LVOT is going to be like. So if you have a narrow neo LVOT, then uh, the chance of LVOT obstruction after implanting the valve is very high and that can be a disaster. Uh, so in such cases, uh, you know, we then end up going a retrograde balloon, uh, trying to push the valve slightly, do a kissing balloon, and uh, it is a real disaster. So it's worthwhile planning this well in advance. Next one. So this is just to give you uh, another MPR to give you an idea of how the valve is going to sit. So if you look at the MPR on the bottom left hand corner, the valve we're going to implant is a balloon expandable valve, which is uh, Innovari, Braille Innovari, and that is about 20 millimeters. So if you look at my measurements, that's where a 20 millimeter in systole is going to end up. And uh, exactly at that point, you can see on the top left hand corner what the likely LVOT is going to be like. And uh, we were convinced that uh, we should be okay to go ahead with a valve in valve. And uh, we are going to try and keep the valve slightly atrially to try and prevent as much uh, uh, covered stent phenomenon of the perimount uh, struts. Next one. Next one. Uh, this is uh, now just a planning for the tra transeptal. So there are uh, several ways to do a mitral uh, valve in valve. Uh, we can do a trans apical, uh, a trans jugular, or a trans uh, vena cable from the femoral vein. The best and uh, the quickest recovery for the patient will be from uh, uh, trans femoral, uh, transeptal. So that is what we intend to do on this patient. So we have just done a planning on where the transeptal should be. So we'd like at least three and a half to four centimeters from the mitral annulus 
to the transeptal point so we have a, a good working uh, length within the uh, systemic circulation plus we want to make sure the trajectory of the entire system is nice and smooth uh, traversing from the right atrium through the septum into the left atrium through the valve into the LV. Next. So, uh, uh, so we in addition to the, uh, the uh, valve planning, the coronary uh, status uh, which we got uh, as part of the gated cardiac sequence is that unfortunately all his grafts were occluded. So, he's had three vein grafts all were occlu occluded. He has no symptoms of typical angina, although one could say uh, the shortness of breath could partly be contributed. So because we're going to involve a lot of rapid pacing, we decided to do an angiogram on the table today uh, before the planned valve procedure. And if there was any uh, dominant vessel occlusion, the plan was to uh, do a, a, a PCI to those vessels. Uh, from a functional perspective, the LV was assessed in detail. The LAD was scarred from mid LAD all the way to the apex and is akinetic. Therefore, any revascularization of LAD, we were going to uh, forget for the moment because there seems to be no viable myocardium. So uh, let's uh, show you the fluoros, what we've been up to so far. So uh, the patient uh, has gone on full GA. Uh, to uh, uh, to perform this procedure, uh, can we get the cameras down? So we have uh, uh, we have uh, uh, femoral uh, arterial and venous axis on both uh, sides, right side and the left side. Let's go to fluoro. So that is uh, a fluoro guided puncture of the artery and vein, which is our routine. Next, 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 next. So uh, we put a temporary pacing wire, uh, which is a balloon tipped wire from the left femoral vein, which is going to allow rapid pacing. And subsequently, we proceeded with an angiogram. And the intention was to revascularize in the same sitting. Uh, uh, you would uh, agree, I hope, uh, that uh, the left main appeared normal, the LAD was occluded, and the circumflex system was largely unobstructed. Uh, the LAD is occluded after mid-course, but uh, we have already decided uh, not to persevere with any revascularization there because the wall is akinetic. Next. The RCA again was uh, largely faultless uh, with moderate atheroma, uh, but uh, no critical or uh, dominant vessel narrowing for us to worry about rapid pacing. And uh, the fact that patient has no annual symptoms, we concluded uh, today that uh, the patient needs no revascularization. So proceeding with the valve, uh, we next. Next. So next. Next, next, next. S so over a stiff system, you can see we are introducing a 24 French uh, uh, cook sheath through the uh, right femoral vein uh, to park it somewhere uh, at the uh, hepatic uh, level. Next, next, next. So once that was done, then uh, the most important step uh, here, one of the important steps is the transeptal puncture. And uh, you can see here we have an SRO and uh, a BRK1 needle uh, system in position. Next. Next. Uh, you can see here we are in the fossa, but that's quite anterior on our AO view. So we want as posterior and as inferior as possible. You can see here I'm just moving uh, my sheath uh, clockwise to try and get as posterior and as inferior to have maximum working length. At the same time, a smooth trajectory for the valve to traverse. Next. Next. Uh, let's show the echo here. Can we show the echo? Can you see the echo here? So here, this is the initial uh, position, right at the center of the fossa, which we didn't want. We want a bit more posterior. Next. And there, this is the posterior mode path. This is what we want. And now to see the distance from the mitral. Next. You can see here in the four chamber view, we measure the distance from the mitral ring. It's about uh, three and a half.
to 4 centimeter, which is plenty for us to work. So we have uh, uh, an adequate spot for us to puncture. Uh, you can see here fluoro, once I'm happy, I've, uh, there you go, uh, we've punctured the interatal septum and uh, we have now uh, uh, gained access into the left atrium. Next. 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 So you can see here on RAO, uh, the SRO sheath trajectory is fairly favorable. That's because the transeptal is not too high, not too medial. It's exactly the right spot to allow, uh, allow uh, access into the valve. And here we didn't use any agilis, just a JR and, uh, and a, a Teflon wire just uh, uh, flies in, as you can see there. Then the wire was exchanged for a pigtail. Next. 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 Uh, this is just a, a, a quick uh, hand injection just to uh, have a feel for how big the LV is and where the uh, Lundquist wire, the stiff system, is going to uh, uh, park itself. And over the, uh, over the uh, pigtail, we parked a uh, Lundquist. Next. 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 So there we have a Lundquist parked. Now the next, uh, the next important step is to dilate the septum to allow the bulky valve system to go through the septum. That's where one uh, is likely to end up in trouble because if it is not adequately dilated and the valve is outside the sheath in the cava, it's a one-way process. You can't get it back. Uh, so therefore, it's worthwhile spending some time to dilate this. So uh, we got a 14 balloon. You can see here. A septal dilatation is done and uh, as, as, as a routine we just leave the balloon there until the valve is ready. This is an important step too because you leave the balloon there for some time it uh, gets nicely dilated. You can see on the REO a very smooth trajectory uh, from the posterior uh, IVC uh, margin uh, leading up to the valve so we are ready for the valve. So let's show you what we've done uh, with the valve. Camera there. can show the valves. Yeah, do you want to move to the cam? Do you want to uh, speak with the valves? As you can see, that, uh, are you able to appreciate that? Yeah, it's on, it's on live. You can go. Yes. Uh, this is a crimp valve. We have already crimped it. This is a um, uh, Braley Innovary valve, which is a cobalt chromium platform with a bovine pericardial leaflet. The most important thing is to see that since it's, uh, the, you're implanting transvenous transeptal, you have to see that the inflow of the valve should be facing towards the handle of the uh, device, of the, of the delivery device. And you have the bare strength which are facing the top because uh, this is primarily made for the aortic position which is the outflow valve. So in short, you have to reverse the valve and then mount it. So we shall now do one final crimping uh, before we, uh, we, we, we take it into the body because we've been keeping it idle for some time. So all the valve loading or crimping uh, are, are done uh, between uh, both of us and uh, uh, we have a, a, a very robust uh, protocol that we've been following. Uh, mostly we've learned from many mistakes that we did and, uh, and now we've uh, come up with a very uh, a fairly foolproof uh, protocol. So I'm just pushing the pusher catheter. Now everything is set to, to go and uh, we will just check the profile. Yeah, okay. Okay, the valve is ready to go. Mm -hmm. Introduce it. Both. So before we uh, put the valve, now we're going to take the balloon out and we can go on the fluoro now. So you're going to hold that. Make sure it doesn't fall off. Okay, fluoro. So coming down on the balloon now. 
Can we check an ACT, please? And throughout this time, we're maintaining an ACT uh, around 300. So the last ACT was 270. We have given some uh, heparin after that. So coming out, sir. Mm. So because the wire, we have a little wire in the LV, it's very important we have the wire continuously in our vision. No, no, don't move. Okay, get rid of that, get rid of that. Okay. Out. Mm -hmm. Holding wire. Okay. Holding wire. Holding. Okay. Introduce the wire. Yeah. So now the entire balloon and the SRO sheath is out. got the wire? Hmm. Just watch the wire, I'm going live. Hmm. So Dr. Prashant is holding the wire because there is a tendency of the wire with the LV contractions to be pushed back. Uh, previously we used to snare the wire uh, into the systemic circulation from a, right from a artery puncture. Now uh, we, we no longer do that unless uh, deemed necessary. Some resistance here. So let's take it and crimp it again and put it in the. Mm. Okay, let's take it out. So if you see, there's a little bit of resistance here. So we are going to crimp the valve again uh, so that uh, we absolutely are sure that uh, it is not uh, under crimped because uh, one should not uh, see any resistance at all because otherwise you'll end up in trouble uh, within, the, within the vascular system when things are almost uh, irreversible. I'll put the loader load, load beforehand. Load yeah. load. So I'm just going to use the loader beforehand uh, to make sure it's all nice and uh, We draw the sheet. Hold this. So a little bit of uh, a step between the valve and the sheath which we are trying to correct now. Any discussion points at this stage? I guess Dr. Prashant and uh, Dr. Anantraman is also here, you can ask. Any quick inputs from the esteemed panelists? Ravinder?
Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear. You. Uh, Balbir, hearing your voice after almost many, many years yeah. or 25 years. Remember, we were together in All India Institute. Right. The uh, can the you show the gradients? The we have a gradient, gradient, simultaneous gradient, which we forgot to show. Uh, Santosh, uh, can you show the, the gradients? The gradient uh, was 30. Show the gradient. Show the shot. Simultaneous gradient. LBLF. Show this on the screen. Hello. Show the gradient. The surgical valve size here is 27 peri mount and uh, although there are various apps like uh, you know you have an app where to uh, where you can uh, see uh, uh, see the sizing uh, the of the valve in the valve um, uh, it's an adverse app uh, but uh, those apps are not accurate the gold standard however is the CT analysis because um, you have to factor in that the whenever there is a degeneration of a bioprosthesis, there is a lot of panus formation which effectively reduces the internal diameter. And uh, it is very important to see what is the true internal diameter which can be only elucidated by a careful CT analysis. Yes. Yes, the, the site. So we lost the transmission. Achilles heel of a atrioventricular valve implantation, transcatheter, is because the atrioventricular junction is very dynamic and hence you cannot achieve the stability at atrioventricular junction. However, if you have a good platform like a significant big MAC, mitral annular calcification or a stent or a valve, then it can be landed. Right. Now we are ready, Gopi. Mm, I hope so. So. Live cam. Hmm. Okay, fix the wire. No, fix the wire seeing where the wire is. Abu, you got it? Uh, too much stiff system in the LV, Abu. Come back. Okay. Uh, do some irrigation here. Irrigation. Live. So go live. Live, live, live. live. Come, uh, come to the groin, please. AP. Come to the groin. X-ray. Okay. Mm. Okay. The orient thing to the yeah. posterior. Posterior. Yeah. Okay. okay. Go up. Uh, no, no, stop, stop. Show me the uh, heart, please. Uh, go camera, come off. Uh, camera, hemo. camera. RAO, implant view, Santosh.
So now we are uh, getting the valve into the system. So this is the point I was saying is the point of no return because now the valve is out, one cannot get it back into the sheath which is why it's important to make sure all loose ends are tied before that. So now I'm going to uh, use the, uh, the natural bend uh, that comes uh, with a wheel in the system to traverse this uh, thing and uh, there we go. That is a fairly reasonable transition. Okay, great. You happy, sir? Save that. So now we are mm. going to come off the pusher system while uh, someone is going to check the pacing wire because with all this movement in the RA, it is very common that the pacing wire uh, moves. Although we did take a lot of uh, precaution to leave a good loop, we will check the pacing threshold because loss of capture is going to be a disaster uh, during uh, valve deployment. Okay, I'm coming uh, uh, off the pusher system. Can we have a small window of so Yoko, TOE? Oh. That will tell us where exactly the valve sure. is now. Sure, one second. Uh, yes. It's, uh, it's uh, oh, one second. I think the e fluoro e helps us usually better, sir, because uh, the, the echo, there's a lot of artifact on the echo. So we struggle to decide on uh, the valve position based on echo. Uh, it, it just gives us some added information on other aspects. But largely the positioning is done on uh, no. fluoro, as you can see here. Uh, on a view usually for the mitral RAO where the, uh, the valve is absolutely uh, perpendicular to the X-ray plane as you can uh, see here. So this is roughly okay mag up there. That's okay. So, so what do you think sir? Yeah. So the trajectory of the valve is uh, always, uh, well, in fact, never will be exactly parallel to the axis of the perimount because of the wire bias. It is going to be uh, at an angle, but uh, you will have to uh, do an imaginary assessment of how this valve is going to land as it expands because it will straighten up. Uh, and as it straighten up, we will go usually very, very slowly so that uh, it's a two-man job uh, that one person will usually do a very slow inflation during rapid pacing and the other has Fully the ability to uh, reposition up to 50% and after that it's, it's no return. Uh, so it's worthwhile taking some time here. Pressure is okay, Shiva? Okay. So I think it's, it's a great advantage for us. We have a fantastic uh, cardiac anesthetic team. Today we have uh, Dr. Shiva and uh, um, and uh, Dr. Chandru, uh, who've been doing most of our valves for years, and uh, you know that's one thing we have to we can forget about. Uh, it's always taken care of. So I think I'm happy there. What do you think, sir? If you rotate it again, will it straighten up? No, no. no. No, no, no. So, I mean, you can change the uh, trajectory of the valve by uh, pulling on the wire, but uh, I mean, once you come off the wire, then uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it will it's change the trajectory, yeah. but it doesn't matter because now I I we are okay. We will yeah. land where we intend to land. Yeah. The intention is to uh, leave about uh, three, four millimeters on the atrial end uh, and then uh, nothing on the ventricular end. That is the intention. But let's see, even if we leave a little bit on the ventricular end, the, the ventricular aspect of the, uh, uh, the valve that we're going to implant, about five millimeters are uh, open Great. anyway. They are not covered. Mm -hmm. So we are okay. Uh, at this point, uh, during uh, inflation and deployment, the most important risk is valve embolization, which is a disaster usually, but uh, we, we will go through uh, uh, steps how to prevent it later. Let's, let's concentrate on the deployment. Uh, check the show, please. Santosh.
Mm. Tell me what are you basing at, Santosh? Sir, 127. One volt? Yes. Okay, set it at maximum output. Pacing at one, huh? Santosh, yes, pacing at one. Leave it at maximum. And uh, we will pace at uh, 180. Yes, we will be prepared to go up to 200. Okay. Uh. Santosh. Yes, sir. Ready. ready. You are on pacing, correct? Yes, sir. Chandru, ready? We are going to rapid pace. There will be no output. Yeah? No need to give any pressures. We, we just want low pressure for a short period. Okay. So, mm. you do the inflation? No, let him do no. I'll hold you. Okay. Because no. last time we had a problem. No, no. Just tell him that. Okay. Tell him that uh, to take this thing. No, I'll do it. Because no, you don't want to have disaster. Okay. You're going to adjust or you're going to adjust? No, no. no final you position. It. Okay. You hold it. Make sure you don't. So, do you ever yeah. balloon no, dilate? Here, learn. Learn do you ever balloon dilate the valve? Uh, no, no, sir. No. We uh, we uh, never no. never dilate a bioprosthetic valve uh, because rarely there is a necessity uh, because the valve just flies in. Uh, however, we have done a few balloon uh, fractures, intended fractures of the bioprosthetic strut because. Uh, a few patients end up having a, a, a 19 or a 21 perimount in the aortic position. Their ID is only 19. So if you put another valve, it will become even smaller. So we sometimes use a non-compliant balloon and, uh, and fracture the previously deployed bioprosthetic valve by one millimeter and that allows you to give extra one millimeter of, uh, of diameter or perimeter for the valve, new valve and therefore negates any gradients. We've done that before, but not for a routine valve implantation like this. Okay, I'm going to yeah. adjust. Yeah. Uh, Abu, you're ready to go? Okay, so uh, trial shot. We're going to go stop breathing. Not now. We're going to go stop breathing, rapid pace, slow inflation. This Abu. should not go up. Up, 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 slow, 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 all the way up, and we get three, four. Yeah? Don't stop pacing. Yeah? Keep your hand away. Okay, ready? No talking. Abu, concentrate on that. Abu, Only see that. Don't see the monitor, Abu. Okay. Okay. So, stop breathing. Start pacing. What is the pressure? Go to 200. Santosh. Okay. Start going slowly. Abu. Start going. Start going. Start going, Abu. Start going. Start going. Start going. Start going. Good. Start going. Keep going. Good, good. Abu. Good. Okay, all the way. It's a lot of resistance here. Not kinked? No, no, it's not kinked. Mm. We have pressure, three, four. Mm. The valve is just not uh, deploying. Mm. Okay. So I'm at three, four atmospheres. Okay, I'm going to come off and. Uh, mm. Okay, don't keep pacing. Don't don't stop pacing. Don't stop pacing. Okay, mm. don't, stop pacing, don't stop pacing. Don't stop don't pacing. Don't stop pacing. Expanding. Do a full expansion. Okay, coming off now. I think yeah. we are flared. Yeah. Okay, coming off. We are post dilatation. Valve will not embolize. It is got uh, okay, engaged. Stop pacing the... now. Stop, stop pacing. pacing. Start breathing. Ventilation on. Ventilation on. Are we getting pressure back? Come in. Give some CPR. 
no uh, pacing is off uh, the stop pacing stop pacing stop pacing what are you doing okay defib, defib go vf stop the pacing no defibrillate 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 200 okay pace mm, okay okay we got another that's okay okay come out here please uh, the bare strength has engaged into the strut yeah, of the valve so it will not embolize yeah yeah okay so we will leave the wire take a 2026 20, uh, zmed so excuse me sir while you stabilize the patient shall we quickly go to the other lab and come back to you yeah the yeah, patient is back now we have an output and uh, we have uh, defibrillated him the yes. prolonged uh, uh, rapid pacing sequence put him into VF. Yeah, it's okay, the sinus rhythm, back, pressures are normal, pressures are 90. So, okay. uh, why don't you go to the next lab and yes. come back yeah, while we'll we clean back up you, this uh, we'll uh, post dilatation and we'll come. Thank you, sir. Hello. So, do we know what is happening at the valve? Sir, Dr. Gopal, we are back with you. Okay, so just show the uh, CINI, please. Fluoro, back, 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 back. So, are we back with you guys? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, we will just show the uh, fluoro uh, of what we did. So you probably saw up to the point that uh, we deployed the valve and uh, it was very tough to expand, probably explain, explained by Panis. Uh, stop. So forward. So this is exactly what I was wondering. That if so you can see. That if we pre-dilate these valves, wouldn't it make it easier to deploy uh -huh. the valve? That's what no, my question was. Sure, sir. But what, what happens is uh, pre-dilatation, the evidence suggests the risk of uh, stroke is very high. Embolization, that is the worldwide evidence. So we generally tend to avoid because, uh, you know, the balloons are tough and usually we should be able to expand. That is the reason we did not pre-dilate. Uh, so here we had uh, some under deployment. So what we did was we just came down with the balloon and went again with the same balloon and that achieved some stability although we were not very happy so we continued rapid pacing and it was fairly long to the point the patient went to VF the patient had to be defibrillated quickly came back to spontaneous circulation with no support and then next we took the entire system out and uh, we took a ZMED 26 balloon you can see here again we did a rapid pacing and uh, let's show the uh, So here you can see rapid pacing going on. Uh, this is a Z-Med balloon. What are you showing? No, back. Stay there. Back. So this is the ZMED balloon going up, you can see there, and that expanded it uh, fairly well, and it, we went up to four atmospheres, and we were happy there. Next. We subsequently did uh, simultaneous uh, pressure gradients. We took everything off, and uh, there is no significant gradient, which we will show you, and uh, we will also show you the LVO gram. Uh, so there you can see a pigtail in the left atrium. Next. This is the uh, uh, LV pigtail. Next. And that is the uh, uh, LVO gram. And there was absolutely no leak, and, uh, uh, and the gradients completely went uh, to a LA mean gradient of uh, 15 from 35, uh, which was a pre procedure. Can we show the simultaneous gradients and uh, shall we show the echo, please? Is it some trivial paravalvular leak there in the echo? 
No. Is it valve? There, no, there is no paravalve leak. There is a, a trivial uh, flow acceleration there, nothing significant getting into the left atrium. Uh, I hope you also saw the LVO gram, which we j showed uh, a few seconds back. Can we show the simultaneous gradients, please? Can you show the three chamber view? to show that there's no LBO obstruction. The LBO gram, uh, I'd like you to see again, that's a very good view to show any LBO obstruction. Show Can we play the LBO gram? Pigtail shot, please. Back. Hmm. So there you can Topic. see in systole the gap between the uh, the valve complex and the uh, endocardial surface of the septum. So that is reasonably okay uh, in uh, in this two-dimensional cut no uh, on fluoro. Really. And uh, there was no leak on fluoro. And here on uh, uh, on echo, when we put the pigtail through, there's a little bit of leak. And once everything's out, everything is okay. So uh, come to fluoro, please. Can we show the gradient, please, camera? Can we show the gradient, simultaneous gradients? Stop, Anuma. Hmm. So I don't know if you remember the initial uh, diastolic gradients between the simultaneous LV and uh, LA. You can see here, uh, you know, uh, a, a complete uh, negation of uh, the uh, uh, simultaneous uh, gradients between LA and uh, LV. So we're going to come off uh, from you and we are going to catch up again in two minutes. We are going to have a discussion out uh, while you go to the other lab and come back, unless you have any questions before that. Okay, sir. Okay, yeah, that is a very good demonstration. We will go back to that. Uh, yes, sir. Hello. Hello, can you hear us? Uh, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Uh, so we, we have closed the case and uh, the echo is uh, satisfactory. We're going to leave on uh, anticoagulation. I thought uh, we will wind down with the two minutes of discussion and any questions from the panel. And uh, uh, we feel we have the outcome, the endpoints, acute endpoints are pretty good. We will see how the patient does uh, until discharge and then uh, follow up. I think last tick we had an opportunity to do uh, a transjugular transeptal mitral. Uh, this time it was a transvenous transeptal. So uh, we be grateful to the organizers for giving us uh, this privilege to be with the esteemed uh, chairpersons and and the and the audience. Uh, any questions uh, from uh, from the from the chairpersons? The wall orifice obtained, is it equivalent to what size of uh, surgical uh, valve? The what we have obtained So now. the uh, internal diameter, yeah, the internal diameter of uh, the uh, perimount is 25.5. Uh, so we put a 26 valve, which couldn't have gone anywhere beyond 25.5. So I would say we don't have any evidence now on follow-up CT, we'll know. Uh, I guess we'll have anywhere about 25 millimeter. But functionally, said, there is no gradient, the the uh, which, uh, that which, uh, which is good. Not be a ideal match for the patient. Yes, in a surgical bioprosthesis, one can see that the outer diameter is the swimming ring. So when you get a surgical valve, like 25, the actual internal diameter is 22.5. 22.5, yeah. It is 22.5. So in this patient, you will end up with a 22.5, which is obviously quite small. And um, uh, the surgical valve, you have to factor in 3 to 3.5 millimeter of the swimming ring, which effectively reduces the effective orifice area of the surgical bioprosthesis. And uh, uh, th this is the fundamental difference between the transcatheter valve and a surgical valve. Uh, in a transcatheter valve, you don't have a swimming ring, so your effective orifice area is uh, is absolutely corroborating with the actual size of the valve. 
So you still get around 25 to 26 yes. for this valve. Yes. Essentially, the ID of a transcatheter valve is almost the same as the OD of the transcatheter valve, but the ID of a surgical valve is almost 2 or 2.5 millimeter less than the OD of the surgical valve. That's the point uh, I guess we're trying to uh, get across. Okay. So thank you very much, sir. That was a very excellent demonstration. Very yeah, we all really learned and saw uh, new and uh, thank you very much.